to you. I just want to make sure by the end of this discussion, we understand that your desire, your need to change and to get a better job has been met. So thank you. Um, I'm ready to start. Primera, if you wanted to wait for some more people, I can do that. But if you're giving me the go ahead to start now, I can also proceed. Uh, please proceed. All right. So allow me to share my screen and then I'll start with the introduction and I'll get on to the presentation. So ladies and gentlemen in this call, my name is Shamim Walusimbi Nsubuga. I am a global recruitment consultant, but I, uh, my main passion is human resource management. That means I, I love to help people get into the best positions in terms of their career advancement or confidence levels or anything that will enable them to unleash their full potential. Usually people have potential, but they don't know how to depict it. They don't know how to express it. Or that maybe they know, but maybe they don't have the right platforms. Maybe they don't know where to express it from. They don't know who to talk to, to expose them. So basically what I do is uh, I do recruitment. That is talent acquisition. I support companies that are looking to hire everyone who wants a resource, everyone who wants someone to join their company, they're always looking to fill a gap. So that's the first thing we have to understand. We have to understand that when we're looking for a job, you're not just someone who's desperate. You're not someone who doesn't, you know, who just needs money to buy food, money to take care of the bills. You're an asset to the next company that you're going to work with. You are filling a gap and you are fixing something that has been, that people have been struggling to fix. Some people even call it, I'm here to fix your headache. Because every time there is confusion in an organization or in a project, people get stressed, people get strained and they keep thinking, why is it going wrong? What's the problem? Is it that I don't have the right tools? Is it that I don't have the right infrastructure? Usually it's a problem with the skills of the people that you have. That's why unfortunately you see people reaching a point where they have to let someone go in an organization. You, see, you get a, a letter saying that your contract is not going to be renewed or that we are going to terminate you. And you keep wondering why, why I've done, I've been coming every day, I've been waking up early, I've been working overtime. But it's usually that gap that they're trying to fill probably has not been realized at the time when you're working there. So we're going to really talk about how to present yourself at the time when you're looking for a job, but also how to sustain that throughout the period of your employment, just to make sure you're retained and to make sure even if you're to leave, even if you're to live on your own or that to let you go, you will leave an impact. So it always starts from this point, how you get in. So just to share um, the overview of what we're going to talk about, the objectives, I won't focus on Uganda, I'll make it general, since I know there are people from other countries, but basically we're going to talk about uh, CV writing skills, because usually it starts with a CV. If you're looking for a job, the first thing they're going to ask is, okay, where is the CV? Tell me about you, who are you? And yeah, that's what a CV brings to the table. Then we'll talk about the cover letter, which is application letter, how you can express yourself in that area. We'll also talk about how to demystify the shortlisting process. Because the, the last thing that uh, people want is to apply, 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 and they don't get called for interviews. The question that comes is, what's wrong? Are they, do they already have someone in the pipeline and they, they just don't want to tell me? Is it that um, I'm writing the wrong course, like the wrong CV? Is it that there's something wrong with me as an individual? You can ask so many questions. So 
uh, from my position as a recruiter, I'm going to support you in demystifying that, making it more clear about what happens during the time of shortlisting. Then we'll discover interview tips because sometimes you make it to the interview. That basically means that your CV is perfect. There's no problem with it. But when it comes to presenting yourself physically, then you end up failing. So I'm going to answer the question of why. Why does that happen? Why do I reach all this far? And by the time they call me personally, I, I, someone can feel like, yeah, you know what? They have called me because this is my job. I'm going to get it. I'm going to make sure that I do my best. And the next call would be to ask me when I'm going to start working. So I'm going to, right after that, I will also and help you understand how to search for a job opening. Because at times people want to know where are these jobs? You see um, newspaper adverts, you see jobs circulating all around social media. Maybe you're not seeing the job that you want. Maybe you're not seeing the job that speaks to your career growth. Or maybe you just don't know, like, how come I'm not finding a job? I'm applying to all these jobs that are being advertised, but I'm not getting shortlisted. So what are the different methods I can use to look for a job? So that's basically what we're going to talk about. The presentation is going to circulate around those areas. So I'll start with this first slide. I hope you can all see my screen because I will be sharing visuals most of the presentation so the first thing i'm saying i'm showing you is what it all begins with which is your personal brand your personal brand can speak for you in rooms that where you're not around your personal brand can actually live beyond you that's your legacy this is something that people will remember you for people will understand that you know what, this person actually stood for this, stood for that. She had these values, she had these skills. So this is not something that is just a piece of paper. Right now, what you see before you, there are words, yes. But there are also experiences. There are also situations that I went through as an individual. There are also intentional progress that I made as an individual to make sure that I have a well laid out personal brand that I call my professional profile. So you have to start by doing a, a self-reflection. Try to think, okay, what have I done in my life that I can really speak highly about? What is there that someone can definitely say about me? and uh, support me in my job search. Because what you don't know is that at the time of application, sometimes they do a check on you. Your CV might be wonderful. You're maybe you're going for interviews already and it's amazing that they, they feel your energy. They believe that you're going to actually come and fix that gap. Remember it starts with a gap, the headache that they're trying to um, fix. Huh? So they can't believe in you, but there'll be a point where they need to do checks on you. Usually it's a vetting process. So at the point when they do checks on you, are they, they're going to ask people who have interacted with you. They're going to check your social media to see your progress, what you've been doing, what you've been sharing, what you've been liking. They're going to check different areas that are probably 360 degrees around you. Sometimes they'll check with the people that you have been reporting to but they can also check with those who you've been managing below. They would want to see your behavior. They'd want to see your character. So this is one of the most important parts, your professional profile. And what I can tell you now is that you have to be very, very intentional about it right from right now, immediately. You don't have to wait to the, to the time when you're looking for a job to actually start like putting things together, no. So what you see before you is my personal profile. I'm Shamim. I, as you can see at the very bottom, I've summarized it in three words, passionate, analytical, and committed. So this is an exercise I would want you to do in your free time. Try to reflect on yourself, your ambitions, what people think about you, what you think about yourself, and try to summarize it into three words. 
so why I say I'm passionate, because my passion is in HR, human resource management, and it speaks for itself because any human resource related activity, whether it's a social networking event, a training, uh, a request for leadership, um, I always put my hand up. I make sure I know what I follow because I know that that is what is going to grow my passion. That is where my heart belongs. Mine is HR, what is yours? Ask yourself. But one thing I know is that if anyone who knows me asks, what is Shamim passionate about? The chances are uh, most of the people, a large percentage will be like, I know she's passionate about HR. And why? Because they see me at the events, they see me at the trainings, they see me organizing, they see me putting myself out to volunteer for those services. Then there's analytical. An analytical person is someone who looks at things from different perspectives. You try to understand my perspective, but you also think about it from a different angle. You try to calculate the impact that it would create if you were going to do something in a, in a way that is going to affect people. If you're going to send someone a warning letter, you have to have some empathy. You have to understand that, of course, a person is not going to be happy to receive this letter. So what are you going to do? How are you going to present it? How are you going to actually showcase the empathy, but in a way that you still have to follow a principle? So basically you have to analyze in different ways. If you can use metrics, right now people use a lot of metrics, data-driven decisions, all that is being analytical. And uh, that's what I've been intentionally doing. I've gone through for Excel classes, I've understood the latest trends. I know right now we're looking into AI, artificial intelligence, to help us speed up our work. So I'm always curious to understand what I can do to showcase my abilities in an analytical way. Committed, if you give me a task and you give me a timeline and I agree, I will make sure I deliver. So commitment is something that people see just by the fact that you deliver. If you keep disappointing people, right now people call it ghosting. So you maybe say that you're going to be somewhere, you don't show up, you switch off your phone. Yeah, you can get away with it. You're like probably, usually the millennials especially, you can say, you know, this person is stressing me. I don't want to deal with this. But in the end, over time, they will know that you're not a committed person. There might be something that comes up and maybe it would actually be beneficial to you and you'd want to be there. But the very fact that you did not send a regret, you did not uh, communicate earlier, you did not share that you are not interested in the first place, that lack of commitment could actually cost you something in future. And remember what we're talking about is the referral bit of it, how are people going to say about you at the time when you are, you need to have a reference. So my, I also speak about my, my achievements. Currently, I'm serving as a vice president of the Human Resource Managers Association of Uganda, but I didn't just wake up and get there. I had to go through a process. I started with a lower position. I showed my abilities. I rose to a middle position. I still delivered. So it's all about building the trust because eh? such positions, it's all about the people that actually believe that you can deliver. And how someone believes that you can deliver is if they have actually seen you delivering in the past. My MBA, I got a scholarship and that's, it's the same principle. I didn't have the best grades. I, I'm not the smartest person alive. Usually people think I can't, con I can't continue with my education because I don't have the money. So let me just give up. I was at that point, when I was 25 years old, I was at that point, and I call it a, a quarter life crisis. I was like, okay, now I'm independent. I don't have enough money. I'm struggling to get a job. I want to do my master's. But you just push, you just push and think out of the box. How can I get sponsorship? How can I get a scholarship? So that is one of the achievements because I actually had to volunteer with a, one of the um, embassies in Malaysia, I volunteered to get a scholarship such that I can actually pursue my master's degree. And it's the same principle I'm using to look for a scholarship to do my PhD. 
because I know it's not it's not easy to just wake up and have the the money to pay for yourself but you know that you need to always be hungry for education you have to be hungry for knowledge so I did um, apply to UNICAF and I did get a partial scholarship for the PhD so what I'm what am I saying really what am I communicating this is really about me and I can't say that I've reached the summit of where I want to be but it's a profile it's something I'm building but all every single word you're seeing on the screen it was an action it was sacrifice that I made it was the ability to show up if you've promised you just show up just be there if you've been given an assignment you do it you're tired you're stressed you have burnout you you take some time you relax and do it because eventually these are the words that you're going to present on your cv on your profile in an interview and you have to make sure they're genuine because if you say wonderful things and they do the check and it's the opposite they'll actually blacklist you completely they'll say you know this person is a total liar they say they're this but when I ask around, the, everyone is saying, no, 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 no. That person is, has a lot of issues. So hope we understand that this is really where it starts from you as an individual, your activities, what you do, what you expose yourself to. Right now, some people are on a public holiday, they're resting, but you have actually taken time to get onto your device and log on and try to learn something new. That means you're setting yourself a bit higher than where you are previously. So I'll continue. Now we'll go on to demystify the shortlisting process. So uh, just like I mentioned earlier, there are times where you go through the whole process of applying, you actually get depressed because you're applying, you even go through people that you know they're like, yeah, I know Shamim. She's she's in the HR Managers Association, so she knows all these HRs. Maybe if she puts in a word for me, maybe if she helps me, or maybe I know this one. My uncle is the CEO of this, or my cousin. Like you always think, okay, if I'm not doing it myself, can someone do it for me? Etc. Etc. So now I just want to help you to understand from a recruiter's side of view how it actually works. Huh? So one will first define talent acquisition. Talent acquisition is the process of identifying and acquiring skilled workers to meet your organizational needs. The key cornerstone to talent acquisition is developing a robust candidate pipeline for effective selection. So basically, you have to make sure that as a, as a recruiter, it's actually beneficial to have many, many applicants. Why? Because it increases the chances of you getting the one person you need. And that's the reason why one of the KPIs for recruiters is to have a following, is to have many people like seeing your adverts, many people like being able to apply. So if you look at um, most recruiters, I'm a recruiter and I'm on LinkedIn, actually share relevant information. And it's intentional because not only do I want to give information, but I also want to, to get to a point where I have something important, like have a role that I'm recruiting for. I make sure that all the people that have been seeing every other information I share get to see this job, such that if they know someone, they can share it with them just to increase the chance of me getting the right person. So it's not that we want to waste people's time. No, that's not it. But the further a job goes, the better the chances of getting the right person because honest truth is talent is not easy to find and uh, we always struggle as recruiters you can get uh, so, so many applications but in the end you don't even find anyone and keep and then you as an applicant you can keep saying i can do that job why don't you just give me a chance why don't you just give me an interview but if you're looking at the principle you have to meet the criteria so when I'm, I'm going to share with you the, the process, lead generation is actually putting out the advert and getting people to apply, getting people to express interest. And the, the more you target to the right people, let's say I'm looking for an accountant, 
yes, I can put it generally, but I'll get higher chances of getting the right person if I put it in a group where I know there are accountants who actually access that group. It might be a WhatsApp group, it might be CPA itself. I ask the administrator at CPA or SCCA, please, can you push this to your email list? It increases the chances of getting the right people, not maybe like an HR like me and, and, and I don't have a job. I'm like, I think I can do an accounting job. If you just give me a chance, I can learn on the job. So most companies actually want to get it right the first time. So we, after getting the leads, that is the application, we go through shortlisting. So that is where you, you have a job description where you see the advert. So you have a, a degree that they need, or they are open to. They are open to a few others, but they have their preferred qualification. They have their preferred um, qualification. They have their preferred number of years of experience. Yeah, so you have different uh, requirements. I want a degree in accounting. I want 10 years, quality, 10 years experience. It's because I know what it takes. I need someone who is grounded, who has been through it, who has been through challenges in this area, such that when one comes, they're not shocked. They don't get confused and say, no, I'm sorry, I, I, I've never gone through this. So it, it really depends. Some roles actually want a few years because they want someone to train, someone who's open-minded, someone who's ready to just receive and understand based on the organization. But sometimes you want someone who is already good someone who is perfect at what they do. And they're just going to be now giving, they're going to be the advisor of the organization in that area. So that shortlisting process looks, makes us look at those areas such that we can just break it down. Then we go through the technical assessments and interviews. You can find one, we can send a written assessment question. We ask the person to tell us uh, to answer a few questions that are related to the role, just to see if they understand the principles. You can ask them to explain uh, the, maybe the processes that are, are used in this area, the principles. And if they pass, then they go to the oral. That's where you, have, you find people asking, tell us about yourself, the questions that people actually dread. Then they, they, they still go on to ask uh, multiple questions just to confirm the competence in the role. What is in your CV? Is it really true? Did you actually do this, this work? Did you actually achieve this? So those are the questions that are asked during the interviews. So if you pass the interviews, you go through the process of psychometric assessments. There, now you're perfect. You have a good profile, but how is your behavior? What, what, what would we, expect if you come in how is your attitude are you going to be someone who's going to be shouting at everyone to get the job done going to working with that then there's vetting and reference checks that's where they check the background. They confirm all that you're saying. They check your degree. Is it actually the right one? And then the offer. If you go through all that, that's where you start celebrating. Once you get the offer. So yeah, that's the process. So some people don't know it. And some people ask why? Why did I reach its level? And I actually didn't go through. Why didn't they call me back? So basically, sometimes it's because it's automated. We have application tracking systems. Sometimes you don't even get a human being to check your application. You just have a computer and the computer is asking the questions. The human being only comes at the time when you actually have to do an interview Sometimes even AI does the interview for us. So you can't confirm eh, at which point. So basically, this is the whole process that we go through 
when we are acquiring talent. So I don't know if it's understood, but now we're going to go to understand how we can stand out in this process, how we can be the best. Okay, so just give me one second. Let me just grab a charger for the laptop. Just give me one second. Hello, hello. Please ask, you can send through your questions on the chat in the meantime. Any question that you've ever had for an HR professional before in your life, please feel free to ask it today. If you'd like to send it to me directly or to Hilda directly, please feel free. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So I just had to relocate for battery issues. <laughs> so basically, yeah, please do share your questions in the chat. I'll be able to respond to them after the presentation. Now we're going to talk about the job search. Have you ever applied for a job? If you did, how did you find out about the vacancy? Because that's always a first step. Where do you get these jobs? Where are they advertised? So I'm going to ask you to write down your answer in the chat, because it's something that I'm interested in. Where, how, how do people find jobs? Let me give it a moment. Have you ever applied for a job? And if so, how did you find out about the vacancy? Yes, we have Doreen saying company websites, share on social media. LinkedIn, email, websites, online, WhatsApp, group adverts. So yes, as, as you can see from the responses, at times people share with you the job, sometimes you look for them yourself. There are different ways that job adverts are, are actually located. So what I'm going to share with you is some of the common areas where you can find these jobs. One, the visible market where you can actually see the jobs. There is print media, that's the newspapers and uh, so on. Then there are employment agencies that are human resource consulting firms similar to where I work, because I work with Aldelia Global Manpower, it's a human resource consultancy. So there we, we are actually obliged to match a company with a job seeker. Then there's online job search or portals, social networking sites, government career lines. Then there are other job leads. These are direct applications. Some people actually go, even if there's no opening, you just hear that this company is having this challenge. Then you go with your track record, with your CV and say, you know what? I'm the answer to that challenge. I'm the person that is going to fix your headache. Just give me a chance and you get an opportunity. Sometimes it's networking. People say, you know what, I had there's this job and I think you're really good for it. There are also job fairs. Sometimes we as a human resource professionals go out to look out for people in the job fairs. There's a, you can also start as an intern or a volunteer or a trainee. Sometimes they want to just see that you can do the work. And if you can't, they retain you or they absorb you. Then there are sector specific journals or associations. For example, the Human Resource Managers Association of Uganda. You can just come and you never know, there might be opportunities and people are struggling to look out for opportunities in that area. So just like I said, as a recruiter, sometimes I go to CPA and say, I want an accountant, please share. I can want an HR. I say, you want an, I want an HR, please share this advert. 
So you have to make sure you are in those networks, you are connected, you make sure if you meet people, you share with them your desire, your strengths, your abilities. Remember the personal branding that we started with, you always have to make sure your personal brand speaks out, either you show people, or you can even share the information. Like if someone asks me who I am, what are my top three strengths? I'll be like, I'm passionate, analytical, and committed. So this are just, it's just a summary of three, but below that, eh, there are so many things. So anytime that you get an opportunity to network, share this such that someone can refer you when they get the opportunity. All right. So now we got the most important part. They want you, they have heard about you, but now they want to see what you have. So you're not going to go there and start talking. You have to put it on paper. So what is a CV or a resume? Your CV is a reflection of your personal brand. It is your product trying to get an att attraction of an employer who is the buyer. Like you're selling yourself to an, an organization, it might be a project. So this CV is really you in writing. It's you on a piece of paper. So it must be impressive and attractive. First impression counts. If you present a CV and even the first impression, someone's like, can you really do that job? Let me, let me read. But if someone gets your CV, receives it, and even the layout is beautiful, the layout is organized, not writing different fonts, different typing, um, maybe sizes, font sizes. Even that alone can make someone question and say, will this person really be organized? By the time they can't be organized in the CV, will they be able to organize my department? Will they be able to organize this headache that I'm facing right now? And you'll find that the person is probably have, having the skills, but just the impression, they might even give you a chance, but in their mind, they always remember that person had a poor CV, poorly written CV, poorly structured, poorly everything. They'll always have that doubt. Eh? So this is the first impression that you need in order to make sure that people believe in you. They get that trust that you're going to fill the gap. You're going to fix the headache. You're going to build the project that they're trying to build as well. So some of the key areas, you have to be brief and specific to the competency required. Yes, yeah, sometimes you can believe that you can do so many things, but this particular job needs one or two of your skills. So yes, I might, I'll just give an example of my profession. They want a recruiter. So I'm a human resource professional and human resource has so many functions. They have performance management, training, and so forth and so on. So I might present you a CV for a recruitment job, which is a function, a small function of, of uh, HR, which I know I can do very well, but my CV will show that I am very good at all HR things. I can even train you. I can, I can support in performance management. I can do this, I can do that. So the person who's looking at your CV will see all the wonderful things, but then they'll be like, but can you do recruitment? Me, I just want to know about this. So they'll keep looking, they'll just put you on, on the maybe side and say, you know what, maybe I like this person, but maybe if I don't find someone specialized in this area, then I'll consider. So it doesn't mean that you focusing on that need that they want is going to say that you're not good at the rest of the things. It's just that you have to highlight the one or two competencies that they're looking for. If they want someone very, very good at communications, communications manager, and you have so many other skills, you have uh, public relations, you, you can do media relations, you can do so many things. They want someone to focus on communication, internal and external. Like you have to write about your competency in that, and you can still write, you can emphasize what they want, but you can still write other things below. So, and now we're going to talk about the length. For fresh graduates, if you don't have so much experience, it should be quite brief, one to two pages. But if you have more than two years uh, work experience, still don't make it too long. We've had some of uh, our clients at my company. 
the recruitment agency saying that why would someone submit a 10 page CV? Like, did you even read this? They're asking the recruiter. Like, did you really read this? Like, this, I'm not, I'm not happy with this submission. Please just ignore it. Imagine they don't, they, 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 they can't even read. They can't even take the, the moment to understand what is in the profile. So it's always important to keep it as brief and precise as possible. Three pages, if you have to push it, then four. But please don't make it uh, more than six because they, the, they won't believe. They will be like, you're just writing all your tasks that were given to you. You're not showing us what you actually did. Then you have to customize your experience to each job application. You have to make sure that uh, what you're sharing is part of what you did eh, in terms of your achievements, in terms of your experience. And if they're asking for uh, this particular role, don't send something that you sent for a previous role. Try your best to understand, read through the job description, the minimum criteria, the qualities they look out for and align your CV to that. Then highlight your, your key achievements per role in chronological order. So you have to make sure that the achievements speak for you. We need to see some metrics there. Actually increase the, because of my actions, I increased the company profitability by 15%. I, because of my abilities, I managed to increase the, the headcount to this amount. We, we just need some numbers there. We need to see the impact that you created. We don't want to just know what you did, but how did what you did, what you did, how did it impact the organization? How did it fix the headache that we're trying to fix in this company? How, if you if you have been able to do it successfully there, then I can trust you, to, I can give you a chance. Remember, they give you a chance, they give you a probation period. And if you pass it, you go on. If you don't, they can always say, no, we tried and we thought you were the best, but so. How to make an impression. So did you know that you have approximately seven seconds to make an impression based on your CV? Seven seconds, count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Next. So those seven seconds really have to count. Eh? They have to make sure that by the time I, as a recruiter, me as an HR, me who is shortlisting, even if it's a line manager, because right now the line managers actually have more power in this shortlisting process. They are the ones who make the decisions on who to select. Even the CEOs, sometimes you go up to the CEO level. If you, if, it, if your CV doesn't make an impression to them in those seven seconds, they will doubt you. And when they doubt you, they will, decide to look, keep looking, just keep looking. I don't believe this person, keep looking. So you have to make sure it's well-structured. There are plenty of uh, templates that you can consider. You can go to Google, even Google, normal Google, type a modern CV template. It might give you one or it might direct you to different sites. My favorite is Canva, the one that I use for myself and for people that reach out to me for support. So basically it structures you because once you start with the first page, that first page really has to speak volumes. It has to show that, that small profile of yours, what you're passionate about and what you intend to do. It has to show your personal and, co and your, your contact information. Because sometimes someone can have a wonderful CV, but you're struggling to look for their number. Like, eh, I wish I, I could actually call this person, but. I can't see the number. Some people forget to write the number. Some people forget write a wrong email address. Instead of Gmail, you put Yahoo. I send you an email to invite you for an interview. It bounces. You're like, ah, I've lost this person. And you move on to the next best person. So you have to make sure that it's well structured. It's easy to see. Your qualifications and trainings have to be in chronological order. The, the one at the top, the training should be the most recent. Like mine, I'll write my master's degree, which is the most recent. I recently had a certification in recruitment. So I also put it up at the very top, something that 
someone can easily see. Then when they go lower, that's where they'll you'll be able to see the bachelor's degree, um, where you went for high school, etc. You may not need to go all the way to nursery school because you have to look at what is relevant. So most people, most companies and most employers, um, it's also important to put the high school results because sometimes they actually know that once you went through that level, what you did is going to be relevant. It's the same order for employment. Sometimes we receive a CV within the seven seconds we're looking, we find intern, we find uh, volunteer, like the, the first, first job that they did is the first thing that's there. And we move, we move when we're like, my seven seconds are done. This person is applying for a manager job and what they are right now is an intern. They have just graduated. Why would someone see on the JD that I need 10 years and they have one? Because I'm just basing on the job title. So maybe that person just made a mistake. They should have put the managerial, what they're doing right now as the first job and below, you, you just continue until where you started. I hope you understand the order. You have to use chronological order. You have to make sure that most recent job that you've done is at the top. Then the one before that is right below like that. Cause so many people have lost opportunities just because they don't know the order in which to write their qualifications and their employment. So if you also want to understand your strengths and weaknesses, there are psychometric assessments that, are, that can help you identify all this. So it's important to also know yourself, you understand yourself, so you can make a very impressive first page of your CV. Cover letter is also uh, very important. Some organizations depend on it before they look at the CV, but some don't. So you have to understand what are the criteria of uh, the cover letter. One, it has to be one page because we'll have some people having a whole novel as a cover letter. That, that won't work. It has to be just a brief, a paragraph or two about yourself. You have to reference where you saw the advert because sometimes people just say, please find my application and you don't know what they're applying for or you just say, have my CV and you don't know which job they're referring to. Personally, I recruit for so many organizations and I receive CVs almost every day. It actually gets overwhelming for most HR people. And remember, it's a job. Even if you're overwhelmed, you have 1,000 CVs coming in every day. You have to know which one has applied for which. So if you don't have that automated system, you, you can receive it by email. And sometimes you, if a person who's applying doesn't make it easy for you to say, you know what, I'm referencing the advert that I saw on this and this for the position of this. You won't know which job. You might even just disregard, you know, like, let me put it later. I'll come back to it when I finish this 1,000 because I'm tired. As in, I, I needed someone to just share where what job they're applying for and where they saw the advert. So it's important you understand this just because you don't want to go through the situation where you missed out, where someone does not give your profile the attention that it deserves just because of uh, some information missing. So you have to make sure that in the cover letter, you have the key competencies, you have the address of the recipient, and most importantly, check your grammar and contact details. Just like we spoke on the CV, if your contact details are wrong, if your email address is incorrect, someone might actually want you, but they can't reach you. If you're having multiple spelling errors, they won't trust you. They'll be like, is this how I'm going to be receiving emails for the, all the, the rest of the time that I'm going to employ you? They will already be biased by you. So just simply do a spell check because it's normal to make a mistake. Anyone can make a mistake. Even I make mistakes as I'm typing emails. But this, oh, the, this has been automated. You have spell checks, you can do a, you can have the Microsoft Word do a spell check for you just to make sure you don't make any mistakes that could cost you. So let's say you've gone through that whole difficult and emotional phase of having to apply 
for a job. And yes, they have called you, they have, they have actually sent an email, or you've even had a one-on-one -on -one with them saying, you know what, I really love your profile. I want to meet you. I want to see what you've got. Please come, come and prove to me that you're the person who's going to fix the headache. Remember where we started from? This is a gap. This is something that is going to really cause an impact in the organization just by you being there. So now, before you go for the interview, you have to make sure you prepare. Preparation is always key. One, understand the job description, because sometimes they, you can, you, maybe you've applied to 100 jobs and they've called you for an interview and you're like, let me just go. No, yes, yes, you have to look at the job description for that role. If it hasn't been sent to you, it's very okay for you to ask for it. Like, thank you for the interview invitation. Can you kindly share with me that job description so that I can go through it for preparation? It's very okay and it's allowed. Look at the tasks because they're going to ask you questions from the tasks. They're going to probably ask, what's the process of doing this? That is a line on the JD. You say that you, in your CV, you say that you've been, you've been through this process, maybe of recruitment. So tell me about the process. How do you do it from start to finish? What challenges have you ever faced in this? They will ask you things that are on the JD. So you read the JD, you understand the scope of the, the job, the skills required, and just align them to your own. Make sure that you're able to express those skills using what you've done. Two, you have to practice beforehand. It's very okay to sit by a computer or to look at yourself in the mirror and just read your body language. If you're going to be in the interview and you're so looking so relaxed, you're just like laying back and like having a facial expression that is not appealing, you don't know that that could be the game changer. They could just see you sitting back and say that, you know, this person is too arrogant for us just because of your body language. So you just have to role play, you have to see your facial expressions. If it's a job that, that needs you to, to speak to clients, customers, you just have to make sure you, you express it eh? in the way that you're, you react, in the way that you're speaking. If you're excited, you have to show, raise your eyebrows, smile. So there's always body language that is, uh, that is important to express in interviews. If you don't practice, the, the, the risk is that you're going to reach and you'll freeze. You'll be like, oh my God, I'm actually here. I don't know what to say. They ask you something and it, you're just in the shock of, I have to converse with someone who I don't know. I've never met this person. They are judging me. So if you practice, especially your, at least your introduction, then that's where it could be the game changer. How you present yourself, are you confident? Do you know what you're saying? ETC. Yes, use examples, try to use practical examples to bring out your competence, be a good listener. We have had scenarios where we ask a candidate a question and they answer something completely different. And you know, interviews are usually time-based. You could have 30 minutes and I have probably five questions to ask. So may have budgeted the time that I need. So if I find that you're answering something completely different and the time for that one question has elapsed, I could just cut you short and on my score sheet, I'll put zero. They don't know anything about it. And it might have been, you just didn't hear the question. So you just have to make sure you listen. If you haven't heard or understood, it's okay to say, sorry, I beg your pardon. It's just how you present it, not, um, you repeat, you repeat, like just be polite in how you request for, for them to say it again. Then you have to show confidence and maturity. You have to make sure that when they believe that when they get you in that job, you're not going to be again pushing them down. Because eh? there are some people, yes, they are able to train you. They're able to build your capacity. But they also don't want to distract other people in the company, all of them paying attention to now making sure that you learn. They want you to have that maturity to ask questions, to observe, to see and, and just do research on your own. So if you show that confidence and the maturity that you're going to be able to do something with limited support, then at least they'll believe that, yeah, this person is going to come, 
and fix the gap, fix the headache. Focus on your strength. Sometimes people come in and they, they just start by saying their problems. My God, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm a single mother. I have like this and these problems. They're going to chase me out next week if I don't pay rent. Or you can say what you didn't do in your previous job. Like eh, last time they fired almost everyone. I was the HR, but they fired almost everyone. I tried to retain them, but I couldn't. So all that, whatever you're saying that is negative, that is going to stick in their minds. What you need to do is focus on your strengths. Yes, they might ask you three questions to ask to find out the challenges you had, but you say, you can speak about them, but focus, like change it very quickly to something that you did positively. Yeah, they fired everyone, but I was able to create a succession plan such that people that were leaving were able to train other people and it pro provided continuity because someone might be having that headache of people are leaving. So is this person going to come and people will continue leaving or they're going to come even if they leave, they will have a plan to help them make sure that the project continues. So you focus on your strengths. So if it's a physical interview, make sure you're early. We have problems of traffic jam, which is very common. We've had people who are panicking. It's even unfortunate. I had a story of someone who actually fell in a ditch. They were just rushing. They had to jump out of a car and run for an interview. They fell in a ditch and they broke their leg. It was so sad. But these are stories that that actually true. I didn't know them personally, and I did. It was in my interview. But just hearing someone is out of time, eh? it really it breaks my heart. So if you can just in, if your interview is scheduled for two, in your mind, just know it's scheduled for 1.30. Just make sure whatever mode of transport you're using, whether it's going to take one hour, two hours, just make sure in your mind, you know you have to reach there 30 minutes before. Smartness is key. At times you have to dress for the job that you're going to do. Make sure you're decent, make sure you are presentable because that is the first impression before they even speak to you. They're going to be looking at you. Does if it's a gentleman, do I does he have a haircut? Is, is he looking shabby? They sometimes they even look at the colors. Are they clean? The, the small detail, you might take it for granted at the time you're dressing, but you know what? They notice because honestly, at the panel, they are judging you. That's the honest truth. They are judging you. So you just have to make sure you do everything in your power to make sure that you are giving the best first impression, research about the company. Something, that's the first question that most people ask. Like, so what do you know about this company? So if you say, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I, mean, I just came for the interview. That's in their mind, they have disqualified you. Then if you're the best, even if you answer the best, the fact that you, you don't even know my vision, you don't even know our mission, like who do you intend to work for if you don't even know about us? In their minds, they'll be like, you, you, you're not going to be committed to us. You, you might do that job, but you'll be looking for other jobs. So just research about the company at the very basic, the vision and mission. So for online interviews, lately we have had to switch to online, basically for it's convenient. Uh, it helps to save money, both for the interviewer and as well as the candidate. You don't have to spend money going. Uh, like on transport or on, on other things. Basically, you can use the same money to just buy data, make sure you have strong internet connection. So if you're going for an online interview, you have to make sure, first of all, you know how to use the tools. The most common are Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Google Meet. So the worst thing for a recruiter is reaching the interview and you spend the first 20 minutes saying, hello, 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 can you hear me, can you hear me? It, it really irritates, especially the interviewer who knows I have only 30 minutes and now I have only 10 minutes. The person has just settled, they have just stabilized. Now how am I going to ask all these five questions in 10 minutes? I'm going to have to rush and I'm going to have to forge a score. So you just struggle to try eh, to find, or you have to make sure that next person is communicated to, to log on later. So it destabilizes. Eh? So just try to understand these tools. 
make sure you test for stable network and internet connection. Just uh, if you know that you're going to do the interview at this time, look for the right place with Wi-Fi, or if you're going to use your mobile data, just make sure it's well loaded. If you expect calls, you just tell the people close to you, please don't call me during this time. I'll, I'll be engaged, I'll be in an interview. Just make sure you don't get interruptions for just those few minutes. Video usage, sometimes people get shocked. They say you're invited for, for an online interview, but when you reach this, you ask them, okay, turn on your video and like, uh, sorry, my, my device does not have video. Or you start fidgeting to look forward to where you thought it uh, was not going to be a video interview. Like, okay, let me, let me come, hold on, hold on. And they can tell that you're fidgeting. So just know most online interviews require video usage because they still need to read your body language. They still need to see you. They still need to connect with you. It's very hard for someone to select a person who they have never seen. Then your audio should be clear. You have to make sure people hear what you're saying. And learn how to share the screen in case you're required to present. Like for this session, I had to present. So I had to, learn, I had to make sure that I know which button to use to screen share. Um, you, you've had cases where you're supposed to share and you also take like the 10 minutes of the time finding out where to share. Let's see. If you're not sure about it, you can still send a copy to someone in the organization and say, please find attach my presentation ahead of the interview such that you have a backup. There's always a way around it. Ask for clarification. Just like I mentioned, you have to listen. And if you need clarification, you ask. And yes, be honest with your answers because the last thing someone wants is to get so excited. But when they go to the, area, the, the time of vetting, reference checks, they're highly disappointed. So it's important to be honest. So I've come to the end of my session. I've really taken you through what it takes to get that next job. And uh, really at this point, the rest is up to you. You have to make sure you implement the learnings right from the start of this, which is a personal branding. If you're required to do something, if you're required to be somewhere, just show up. You have to make sure that what you do, your actions speak for you. You have to make sure that someone is able to send you that job advert. You say, you know what, I read this job advert and I thought of you. Why? Because I, I see that you're very passionate about this. I see that you're very good at, at this activity, at this profession. Try it. If you're not, then maybe you can share it with someone. So this is a process that you need to follow and Definitely, if you stick to the principles, if you prepare well, if you express yourself in the right way, and most importantly, if you deliver in the job, then no doubt you'll be able to get your next dream job. Thank you very much. Back to you, Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Shamim. Thank you. I've learned a lot, even after my many years of work. I have not done that many um, job applications, so it's uh, this is very, very helpful for me too. Now, I have many, many questions, but one of the questions that stand out for me is, what's the difference between a cover letter and a resume and an application letter? What's the difference between the three? All right, so the cover letter is the one that you attach at the, at the top. Let's say that it's the first thing that they see before the CV. So it's just a summary of your profile, a summary of where you saw the advert, the position that you're applying to, and what you bring to the table, just in one page. That's a cover letter. For a CV, it's more detailed. You now uh, de detail the places you, did, the, you worked, the activities you had, as well as the achievements. Resume is the more brief and precise one. You can have the place you worked and the achievements. So most people prefer to receive resumes because they are brief, precise, and they, they draw someone to, and to want to know more about the person. Like, okay, I see that you're able to achieve this by 100%. So who are you really? Then they call you for the interview. So that's the difference. 
right. Thank you so much for answering that question. Then another question I received is, uh, must uh, the resume have a picture with it? It's not compulsory. Um, it would only add value if you're going to have probably a client facing job because they would want to see what brand, what is your brand? How do you look like? And it would only benefit you if that photo is actually good. If you believe that, yeah, my, I would really fit into this brand. If it's maybe a studio photo, if it's something that would sell you as an individual, depending on how you're even dressed, how you look in your face and your facial expression in the photo. So it would only benefit you if it is uh, depending on the job that you're going to apply for. So you have to just be careful about which job and how you'd want them to perceive you. Is this the kind of brand that most accountants have if I'm to Google accountants? Is this picture reflecting that? Yeah, so you just have to analyze and see first. And let me take you back to the session where you were talking about uh, how you shortlist. So someone was concerned about how many, many companies they keep seeing adverts over and over, and then they keep seeing the companies re-advertising over and over again. And then they also don't receive any feedback from the job application they had sent you. Do you have any comments or anything you'd say around that from a recruiter point of view? Uh, yes, I can share my opinion. So basically that's what happens when you find that the CVs that have been received are totally off, off scope. They call it off scope, out of scope. So you have, you have advertised for a very specialized job with this number of years of experience, but the applications you've, you've received are not reaching the level that you need. So definitely you can't move to the next stage if you have not fulfilled that. So some companies are very strict in terms of the principles, they will not look out for some So I know if you're not on that app, just put your allowance effect. They are processing an application. Give feedback to you. If you know, you can never receive you. You could just tell them. Uh, unfortunately, Shamim, you may have to switch off your t your your video. Your 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 bit. Uh... Your network is a bit unstable. Can hear you. Okay. Is this better? So much better. All right. So about the feedback, yeah, at times it's difficult for if you're an individual to respond to multiple applicants, but that's where the AI tools are coming in. Right now, most companies are adjusting to application tracking systems that give automated feedback. Like if you're shortlisted, they put you in a folder and it sends an email automatically. If you're not, the recruiter drags you to a folder and uh, and you're given a regret email. I don't know, Primary, can you hear me? Um, now you're very clear. Okay. Great. Right. Yeah, so, so that means hmm. that means if I had applied for a job and then I find that they have put it out again, I shouldn't apply again. Does that, is that what that means? It doesn't stop you from applying again. You can apply again. It's just not guaranteed that you'll be called at this for the next uh, session, but doesn't mean you can't apply again. One thing I know, sometimes these things are a thing of chance. If you, if you reorganize your CV and apply again, 
something more specialized to the job. You never know this time, maybe that the system, first of all, it's a system that shortlists, maybe the system will shortlist you. Maybe the human resource person will look, will take another look and say, you know what, maybe let me check this. So it doesn't stop you, you from- it. Oh, You can try some. Yeah, it doesn't stop you from organizing. All right, so basically it's re-advertised again. I reorganize my CV, I reorganize my cover letter, and I can send it through again. I may get lucky. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, so I have a question from Joyce. She's asking how would she best answer the question? Tell me about yourself and what is your weakness? How would she best answer that question? Tell me about yourself and? And what is your weakness? Mm. So now that, that really depends on her specifically. She has to, first of all, give a summary of her education. My name is this. Um, you can start with your strengths, something that you're very good at. I'll give an example of myself. My name is Shamim. I'm passionate about HR. Uh, I'm, I'm really talented at this and that. My strengths are I'm passionate, I'm committed, I'm an analytical. And I, it's something that I would want to express in this organization. Then you can go back to your education because the keywords are what you what you love, what you're passionate about, what you enjoy doing. And the only way that they'll listen to you is if it's in connection to the job that you're applying to. So you can start with your name, what you're passionate about, what, are, what your strengths are, where are you, what you did in terms of qualification, especially the, the most relevant to the job and uh, where you've worked before and what you do, what you're going to bring to the table. Why should they choose you? So about the weaknesses, that is a trick question. Honestly, you have to be very careful. If you know that you're going, let's say an accounting job and you say, I'm very bad with keeping money. I'm, I'm, I'm a spendthrift. Definitely you're, you're already disqualifying yourself. So you have to say something that is neutral to make sure that even if it's something that you can work on, it shouldn't be exposed at that point. So if you have most of the safe responses around work-life balance, because some people are workaholics, but if you're saying that in an interview, it's not going to affect the panelists. It's not going to say that, you know what, they'll be spending more, they'll, they'll even think, okay, maybe they'll be spending more time on my work than other things. So that's a good problem. So you just have to make sure you give weaknesses that are general, that are not uh, biasing you as an individual, and they are not in conflict with what you're applying for. Samira, there, there is this question. I think Shamim should help us. It says, I have, I have been a staying home mom for some time, and now I want to get back to, get back to work. Can I include that time away in my CV? Yeah, you have to you have to be honest, first of all. If there's a gap, depends on what you are doing. Like if you are totally not working, then you just leave it out. But if you are doing something, even if you are doing maybe something on the side or something, a project that you are able to do remotely, you can still justify the gap using that. But yeah, it's okay to have a gap as long. It's not going to bias the recruiter if you're good in terms of your ability to perform, how you answer questions. If you're very good, they will not focus on it. But if you're responding with some gaps, they'll be like, okay, maybe she has, she or he has forgotten the, the task. They might not be able to perform because they have been out of the field for so long. It's going to be hard to train them. So you just have to make sure above all, before the interview or before you're ready to go for a job, you just make sure you keep in, in touch with people in the profession, you keep training, you keep, you keep knowing what is happening on ground. Even as you take a break, don't completely switch off. If there's a training, a webinar, you can just dial in and listen to, just keep informed, just keep knowing, keep on these groups, 
in these associations, they always share information. Such a not in a in an in a position where you really can't respond to questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hilda. Then there is another question. I think it's connected to that in terms of what if I left the job not to be a stay-home mom, but this time I've moved to doing business, business that may not have been related to my career. And then I'm now choosing back to go back to work after a couple of years. How do we consider that? Do I put, should I now consider that the work I've been doing, even if it's not related, or should I just leave it out altogether? Uh, so my opinion, if you're customizing your CV to that profession and there's a gap where you did not do the profession, I've had I've seen people having higher chances of, of success if they leave out the part where they did not do the, the, the related work. Why? Because it's just like I said, at the time of looking at the CV, you want to see how related you are to the job. So if it's always justifiable at that time. You can you can speak about what you did if you're if you're asked, but if not, you focus on the areas that are relevant to the job. All right, thank you very much, Shamim. I have another question regarding uh, the references. So at the bottom, we usually add the references. You tell us to add two or three, and then you call them back. Sometimes you call back a former employer. And what happens if a former employer does not give a very glowing recommendation? The question is, do you, do you look for other, do you go the extra mile to find other sources of alternative responses to be able to gauge about that employee's, potential employee's background? Or do you take what you've had? It depends on the level. So most times people take the word of the supervisor or the human resource person because they are the ones that have the, the right reports. So it's always important at the very least, make sure you're in good relations with those two, the HR person and your supervisor. So if they ask other people, they might take the word of, the, of any of those two above anyone else in the organization because they, they know that they might be biased. Okay, thank you very much. I have another question. At the end of a panel, in terms of the interview, they always ask you one thing. If you have a question to ask, how do you approach that? What if you don't feel like saying anything? Must you have do you really have a question for the panel? Mm, okay, so that question, it's also sometimes a trick question. You might have to read the, the maybe the environment. If you see that indeed the recruiter is, is maybe tired, eh? the person on the panel, because they, they do have to ask, they're obliged to give you the op opportunity to ask. So if you can read that maybe this person is, is not really ready for questions today, it's very okay to say, to compliment, use that opportunity to compliment the people on the panel. If you, if you, you, have, you know them, maybe from the media, you looked at their LinkedIn, you can share your, your opinion on how they have impacted you in that area. Just appreciate, because that always leaves an impression. But if you want to ask a question, still try to say something neutral, something that will not bias the whole, like just ruin the whole, all the effort that you've put in. So some of the initial questions are, like what, what are what are the ambitions of the strategy of the company strategy or something about the company like do you, how do you see this company growing in the next year something that will excite them to to speak about the progress they have made and then when they are done you can say I can't wait to be a part of this I, like I'm excited to join something end with something that is going to excite them, something that will leave them satisfied and wanting to, to also have you included in that. So that's what I would, I would say, just read the environment. If they, they, they actually want you to ask something more technical, then you can ask something that you really want to ask. But if you don't feel like asking completely, you're already freaked out, you're scared, you just want to get out of that place and wait for the feedback, 
Then you, at the very least, complement. Use the opportunity to complement. All right, thank you so much. So I'm going to go a bit technical because of all the HR people I know, you're the one person who is very techy and loves tech in HR. Mm -hmm. Now, we have what we call applicant tracking systems. First, how do I know that when I'm applying for a job that my, my CV is going to go through one of those tracking systems? Is it something I can tell ahead of time as I do the application? Uh, for example, sometimes I click on LinkedIn and say, is the application or they send me to a portal? How can I know that I'm actually, uh, my CV is going to run through in one of those? Or is it now becoming so common that I have no way around it? Then um, what are the do's and don'ts around it uh, from both me as an applicant and from your side? The question was asked from someone who is a founder of uh, a, a company, which is a um, HR company. So from both perspectives, how do we tell and how do we tell and how do we get our CVs to pass through an ATS system? Okay, so if you definitely if you see a, a job that needs you to send your CV to an email, chances are that one does not have an application tracking system in place. And uh, yeah, it can be good, but it can also be bad. Sometimes if, if they receive multiple applications, it's very strenuous for the recruiter or the person shortlisting to focus on each and every CV because they are seeing the bulk of applications. So if you are redirected to a portal, let's say they tell you to go to the website and when you click on the job, then you they ask, they ask you to type in. So most likely those are, are ATS systems. Eh? They actually prompt you to respond. Some of them even have qualifying questions. Like if you say yes or no, it, it will like automatically push you to either the shortlist or not. And some of them are very straightforward. If the JD says, I need someone with this degree and you don't have it, and then you say, no, I don't have it, then those are some of the automated uh, responses that, that it, also, it also has embedded in it. If someone clicks no, send them a regret email. If someone clicks yes, send them to the shortlist. So on my end, when I come at the end of the deadline, I'll, I'll only look at those that are in the shortlist and move them to the next level of interviews. So you just have to, to read the kind of questions. Some of them are open-ended. They, they want you to explain, but some of them are very direct, maybe multiple choice. There, it's already embedded in that uh, if you do not select the right response, you won't be shortlisted. So that is where the world is going. Even uh, the company I work for has uh, already gotten one in place. So basically, you just have to make sure that you look out for opportunities that will enable uh, you to pass through. Even if it's an ATS, you actually are qualified for the job. So you won't have to go through the, the process of wondering, maybe I, I responded wrongly, maybe they have the, the, the system has kicked me out. Maybe like you just have to be sure. There are some jobs where I was very sure that I went through and I actually got a call in my previous um, experience when I was looking for an opportunity. I got a call because I was sure they asked for this, I had it, I put that in. They asked for this. So just try to look out for opportunities that are a perfect match. So actually, you can also express yourself. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Shamim. I have another question about being going for a physical interview. You dealt with an online interview. If I go on to a physical interview and I'm carrying document, how <clears throat> they specifically ask what kind of envelope, how should I present my the documents that I came with? Should I carry photocopies? Should I carry original copies for that physical interview? What should I do? Uh, if you're if you're going for a physical interview, right? Yes, this is specifically physical. Mm -hmm. The basic thing that you need is your CV and copies of your academics, if you have them. Sometimes they are very strict about it, but 
most times they, they check that at a later stage, the academics, but at the very least have copies of your academics and your CV if you're being called for a physical. Why? Because you just don't want to go through the, the shame, let's say shame, uh, or that um, embarrassment, not only on your side, but also on the recruiter side, because they're supposed to prepare all those things. If you've applied, they're supposed to have the pack ready, but if they don't, then you just have to have yours as a backup, your CV, your application letter, and everything uh, that is related that would actually speak for you in the open, in the event that you have an interview. So having uh, at least, let's say, if you want to have a, an envelope, it could be just a plain one, whichever color. But the most the most common are either brown or white. If you want to go the extra mile to just remove all bias, you just use a white one because that one is very neutral. Try to be as neutral as possible because you, you also don't want um, people to judge you based on different things. As long as it's clean, if, you, if you, you can access a new one, just have a new one and make sure that, first of all, you're, you are dressed well. If you're holding something, make sure you're not holding too many things, not these certificate bags, certificate holders. Sometimes it can be bulky. So just that as simple as possible. All right, thank you. So the next time I'm working for physical, very light envelope and white in color to just take away every bias. Mm -hmm. So I have um, one other question. Okay, two. One is about um, the interviews we go through after you've passed the first one. So you mostly talked about me directing a CV, and then uh, doing that first interview. However, I, this one was out of our scope for today, but let me let you answer it very quickly. How do I go through the rest? I've done um, the, the rest which you can do, which are here in the example, they ask about Everlex itself, which is after an oral interview, and they, they want you to um, get recruited. They give you a lot of other tests that you're going to go through. How do you go through them? And why don't the companies give you the, the report that they receive? Why don't they? Yeah, sometimes they take you to different tests just to see the, the principles. Because most of the time, it's if it's automated, it can be your Excel skills, your the basic skills, your understanding. That is really the... Sometimes someone is so good at presenting themselves, but if you give them something practical, they freeze or they fail or they take too much time. So some of the things that they're checking are is your efficiency, your effectiveness. If you get through the job, you can still ask for this because sometimes it's just a matter of uh, that system they're using. They, they do get the reports and sometimes if they're set up, you can also see your scores. But it shouldn't be... Um, so bad if you want to understand your score. Human resource professionals and other people that deal with candidates are actually trained to know that you as the candidate are important. You're one of the key stakeholders and we have to treat you very well. So if you ask to know your score, even if you walk in and say, you know, I was a candidate, just be polite and professional. And I would want to know how I scored in this. At times, if you send it on the request on email, it might be covered up by others. But if you request for an appointment, you, you start by appreciating. You start by appreciating and you share that you're curious about your score and how you how you performed. If it's not confidential, they will share with you the information. So don't never be afraid to ask. And just know that that's, all those tests are just seeing how efficient you are. If you're given a task, are you going to take forever to do it or you're going to perform at least at the, at the moderate pace that we need it to be done? All right, thank you so much. The other one is about dressing for the interview. How should I come to the interview? <laughs> Depends on the job. So if you're going for a client-facing job, you have to understand the nature of your clients. If there are corporates, you have to make sure you're, you're dressed in a corporate way. If you're going to a bank, banks love suits. You have to make sure you have your suit. 
if you're going for an engineering job, at the very least, a button up shirt, very smart pants. The principle is to be decent and smart. Even if you're going for even a fashion superstar job, there you, you're allowed to have the colors and the, be vibrant, but just have, you, uh, bottom line is you just have to be decent because you want to reduce as much bias. Even people who go with revealing stuff, you, you see a lady maybe with cleavage showing, you know, and you get that job, you never know the reason why they're giving you that job is for alternative reasons and you have to pay those debts later. So just make sure you don't create the bias, be decent, make sure the clothes that you're wearing are clean, that you're smelling fresh, because those are the, the, the first impression aspects, how you smell. If you have a perfume, just use it. If you don't, you can borrow for that day. If you don't have a very nice cloth, you can just try rent or something. Just make sure you, you look at the job you're applying to, understand the clients that they face, the stakeholders that they meet, and then you can even look at Google. If I'm looking for an engineering job, I, I look at how engineers dress, on Google and I see the, the, the basic dress code and I dress accordingly, but one thing for sure, I need to be smart, I need to be decent. Like for HRs, we always have to make sure we are decent. If it's the skirt, it has to be at least below the knee. Those basic things that you see human resource people judging for in the workplace because you're, you're a brand. If you have a blazer, you put it on, you know, if you have lipstick, you just put on a little, not too much makeup, be, be neutral, but smart. So it's important you first uh, assess the job, look at the people that they serve, the people that actually look at them and understand the behavior and just research, look at the common um, outfits that people in that profession wear and dress according to that. Okay, thank you very much, Shamim. Uh, one of the last last questions is, uh, in the interviews, am I allowed to take notes as the interviewee? As the interviewee, is something that I've seen common. You just have to be conscious of the time. Because sometimes um, it's not, it's not um, wrong, but it, only, it could only make sense if you're writing to understand if you actually first of all mention i hope you don't mind if i write down some notes i have my piece of paper here like you ask if it's okay because if you start without their consent you never know maybe that particular company or profession is not okay with it and if it's online they might think you're you're referring to the, the paper to answer the questions maybe it's a book maybe it's a reference point or a tablet and you're you're typing in the question in chat GPT to get an answer. So you just want to avoid that bias of, of this person is cheating. You ask if it's okay. And then as they're asking the question, you just write the key, the keywords, eh? not the whole question. Cause sometimes candidates take like another one minute writing down the question that they have had. And that can show the interviewer that you're, you're not efficient. You need to take so much time to understand and interviews, they, the reason why they, they, are, they are in that format of you ask, I answer. It's because they want to see how fast you think, how fast you can go through a situation mentally and, and respond to it. So if you, you show them that because I'm writing, I need enough time to interpret and what, then it, will, it might bias you. But if you can do it like you're writing the keywords as I speak, you refer to them and then you answer immediately, then that will not affect you. All right, thank you so much, Shamim. Now, the one of the last questions is, uh, how do I pick my references for my CV? Who should I pick? Who should I not pick? Okay, so references, you have to make sure you pick people who you know can vouch for you. You have to make sure you get someone within the industry that you're in. Make sure you have some people that are in high, like looked at in high regard. One in the industry, one in high regard, someone who is publicly known, preferably. 
to to be good at what they do. It might be in your profession or out, but someone who has a, a good character, someone who is who, who delivers, someone who is actually very reputable. But for, uh, one thing is for sure, you have to make sure they are aware that you're going to put them as your reference. Because the one thing that you don't want is for the recruiter or the HR to call them and they're asking, yeah, which, which, which John? I know like 10 of them. So you have to make sure that once they, they should be ready to receive a call and once they do, should should be a good reference that they give you. If you, if you have a good relationship with your previous supervisors or your previous HRs, that's why it's important when you're in a workplace, you, you perform, you make sure you're known as a performer, as a deliverer, because sometimes they don't check the references, they skip them and look out for the HR people that worked there to confirm if you actually worked there. They look out for the supervisors to just confirm did this person actually do their work or they were always giving you excuses. So if you have those people in your good books, they're also good to be included in your references just to save them the hassle having to look out for the, the contacts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to ask the last, last question for today. And uh, the last one you will, uh, the one of it is about, should I inquire from an employer if I haven't heard for, from them? They had promised to get back to me in two weeks. How do I do? How do I go about that gracefully? No, like if you're you're ghosted. <laughs> All right. So it's as I mentioned, it's a very emotional process, and yes, it it does hurt to give it your best, and someone doesn't even give you a chance to try, and even go through the interview, and someone doesn't give you a chance to at least show them that you're able to do the work. So how do you go through that gracefully? You, of course, your heart, you feel like you should have been given a chance, but you're okay. it's allowed for you to ask for feedback. Create a relationship, first of all. Make sure that you don't come as someone who is demanding, someone who's going to stress them. Like it wasn't me who made the choice, it was a group of many people. I wasn't the only one. So if you come demanding, then you will not get the audience. They can even tell the security to, to kick you out or to block you. But if you create a relationship, like, I understand I didn't make it, but uh, I'd like to meet you, like, let's have a cup of coffee. Let's let's uh, do something. Let me just create a relationship in any way, even if it's following them. Sometimes now that we're on social media, you can follow the, the people that interviewed you on social media, like their posts, comment on their progress. And then after some time, you can still, just for your closure, just to understand what really, really went wrong. What, what did I not do? You can bring up the question, but the only way that you will really get uh, success in this is by starting with creating a relationship or even complimenting them for the effort because it's not, it's not easy to actually make a choice. You might want someone, but the rest of the panelists want someone else and it has to be a, a consensus. So it, you might reach a point where someone really wanted you and unfortunately everyone else was seeing some weaknesses that they were not, that they, that they thought that they could overlook. So it's important you first appreciate, build a relationship. Then you ask, you ask to understand, not to defend or to come and sue or to what there are people, you'll get more resistance. So if you don't want to have to go through that process and you want to just heal on your own, you want to make sure that you know what, now that it's really about me. Then you go through a period of self-reflection just like we started this presentation, you understand your personal brand, you understand what you need to do to improve. This job needed maybe someone with a master's, I'm just doing my master's, but I'm tired, I wanted to first relax. Then you push yourself, to finish. This job wanted done a CPA, but I've been failing papers, I wanted to give up. You just, it's, it's a 
It's a period where you can do a self-reflection, see what you need to improve, if you need to go for extra training, if you need to start networking with people, if you need to get into these associations, start showing, showcasing your skills. It, it helps you to actually reflect and change as an individual, such that the next time an opportunity presents itself, you know how to also present yourself. You're not going to freeze, you're not going to mumble, you're not going to have poor network. You just understand, okay, I think I failed this to get this job because of this, so let me improve that. And through that period of healing, that's where your true growth is. That's what they call true career development because it comes from within. No, no one is telling you, now go and do this training. Go, like no one is pushing you. You're understanding, I've not got some, something because I wasn't. I didn't have this, so let me push and get it, and I try again. Don't go and give up. You just say, let me do this, and I go and try again. So that, that is what you can do. That's actually the most effective. Just understand, get the closure from within and push yourself to learn what it takes to go to the next level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamim. So the other question for me, which is the last, last question, I mean, people have very many questions. I think we shall have a repeat session. And now we go maybe to the deeper detail in terms of maybe actually writing that cover letter or uh, going into the detail of actually now writing the CV and if people do a practical exercise that you, like you gave in the beginning. But today we shall have to end here. The question is, do you do consultancy work where you meet, you can do like a one-to-one -one and how can people meet you? Um, so I'm trying to support people in this regard. People usually come to me for CV uh, writing services or upgrade services professionally. So I'm really just a call away. Primera, you can share my number on the chat or I can write it. So if you need um, to outsource it, I can still support. But if you just need guidance as well, I'm, I'm trying to set up a system which can enable me to create schedules. Because um, at times it gets overwhelming if multiple people try to come at the same time. So I'm trying to create a scheduling system, which I can still do. But please feel free to reach out to me on WhatsApp if you need guidance, if you need support, I will schedule you. I'll get someone to help schedule you and we go through it together. If you need the practical support in maybe upgrading your CV, if there's a particular job that you know you want to apply, align your CV to, and you need my professional services, I can still support. I'll we will go through it together and we understand. So please, the first step is to reach out to me. If you need an, a physical appointment, then we can also arrange that usually in town on weekdays. So I've shared my WhatsApp number on the chat. All right, thank you very much, Shamim. There is one more person I wanted to talk is uh, Sweeney, are you still around? Yes, I'm around. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay, so my name is Sweeney Ayura and I am the founder of Kryptonite Outsourcing. So uh, Shamim, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for helping us uh, learn on how to make our CV, our cover letter and how to present ourselves during the interview session. So uh, just to talk about Kryptonite, I outsource for clients in the US and these works are virtually we do them virtually. So if some, some of you will be interested to be part of that group that we can outsource for you to US clients, um, you can contact me as well, or maybe you can just go to our social media page, pages and look. But Shamim, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And um, just briefly, uh, not all uh, the, the part of applicant tracking system is uh, not all companies use our um, you can be sending your email, maybe your application to an email, but at the end of the day, what they do with that application or what they do with that CV or cover letter is uh, put it in through a system like the one that we have at Kryptonite Outsourcing. Now it filters out people. So every time someone is applying, 
they should put that uh, in mind that any company that they are applying to, nowadays they are using applicant tracking system software. So it will be so easy if you are put that in mind and you follow through what an applicant tracking system is. So uh, just uh, a few things that you don't need to put in your CV, just to add on what Shamim said, don't, uh, don't write text boxes, hyperlinks, uh, don't copy paste from ChatGPT directly to, to, to your CV and all that. So that is all that I needed to add. I appreciate you for giving me the chance. And if anyone wants to be part of that group or wants to be part of the Kryptonite outsourcing so that you can get chances to be outsourced for US clients, you can follow me. Thank you so much. It, um, what number can we reach you on? Or okay. just so uh, let me just write the company number here. It's a US number, so you can only get our, us on WhatsApp, but we will uh, be in a position to reply to you. So let me just put it here in a minute. All right. Thank you very much, Vini. Okay. We appreciate you and we appreciate the support and the comments to us, Shamim. Thank you so much, Shamim. Shamim is one of the best HR people I've come across. She loves technology. She loves supporting other people. She's a giver. So please feel free to be able to, to, to talk to her and she'll be able to give you the support you need. Thank you very much for this session. Thank you very, very much. I'll hang around a little bit just to make sure that you've gotten all your phone numbers that you need to be able to contact Sweeney and Shamim. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.